I am going to get started by introducing our three um, panelists for today. First off, we have the Senior Associate D Dean and Senior Director of Residential Life, that's Brenda Ice. We are also joined by the Director of Wellness and Nutrition for Dining Services, Michelle Blaze. And finally, the Director of Retail Operations for Dining Services, Bobby Noyes. Um, we are going to start our session talking about residential life and all the great uh, things that are happening over there. So Brenda, please take it away. All right. Hello, greetings and salutations from wherever you are joining us today for a conversation around the new and exciting things that are happening here in residential life. As Mikel mentioned, I am Brenda Ice, and I serve as the Senior Associate Dean, Senior Director of Residential Life. I've been at Brown for a year and seven months, and I've been really excited about the opportunities um, and the ways that we have grown and expanded the residential student experience here. I want to spend, uh, next slide. Uh, um, today, I'm going to spend uh, just a little bit of time doing a quick overview of our strategies and strategic priorities and how they align with the work that we do and then introduce um, the new enhancements that are already in place and the ones that we'll be bringing into for the next academic year. Hopefully you'll find them exciting. Um, and then certainly I'm open at the end of this presentation to answer and fill in any gaps or answer questions that you may have either about your current student experience or about the potential of that residential student experience if you're a new family or student joining us today. And so residential life as, it's, as it stands, we found most of our and, and actually all of our programming in four basic principles. Um, and these fundamentally develop and plan all of the work that we do both for our residential students and also for our own staff and our development. Um, and so we are grounded in inclusive community, health and well-being, growth and development, and operational excellence. From a student standpoint, the inclusive community shows up in the ways in which we provide a diverse living experience for our students. While many students in their current years with us have the ability to choose whom they live with, that usually comes after having spent a year with us where we actually pre-place students, um, hopefully creating a diverse and kind of um, different perspective and way of thinking in their kind of living experience. That also extends to the types of offerings that we have in place with our theme communities, our Greek and program, which I'll explain a little later on in our process, but it really isn't designed to create a space of belonging and connectedness. Many students will come in with a perceived or a perception of who they want to uh, identify with and who they want to be in community with, but often find by being in residence with us that so that expands or their awareness um, is shifted a bit and they start to expand their thinking around that. Health and well-being is an also cornerstone of the work that we do while we have a dedicated space um, in Sternlet Commons that focuses on health and well-being. Please know that it is carried out through all of our res residential living experience. The programs that we design, the way in which our students think about a holistic perspective and not just around your physical health or your mental health, we think about all of those things and how they kind of complement and then sometimes create this counterbalance of discussions. And so we have teams in place that can talk through those particular programs and initiatives. Um, growth and development shows up for us in a variety of ways, but none more apparent in our residential design is that in its first year, we intentionally cohort all students together, um, kind of understanding the development of a new student entering into the world of of uh, a college and a residential experience that we know that your development and ways of thinking are different from that of a junior class member. Um, and then that progresses beyond that residential student experience that as you've started to build your sense of community, your development stages shift a bit, whether you are in a specialized program, if you're in a Greek letter organization, um, if you are a junior considering a study abroad experience, we complement each portion of that development for you. And lastly, our operational excellence is actually seen more internally in the ways in which we constantly improve our processes. So thinking about the ways that our practices show up and impact the student experience are opportunities for us to change that narrative, to update our processes, 
which I'm happy to report in the next few slides, have been in large part driven by student feedback. When they know things are awry or could be better improved, that is the moment where we can actually improve and enhance that experience for our students. And hopefully you can see that in some of the updates um, that we'll present now. Next slide. Um, and so for many of you that have either are currently on campus or will be visiting soon, recognize that we've gone through um, some key construction efforts in the last few years. Um, in the bottom corner, um, Stern Lake Commons already is in full operation. It opened in August of 2021 and serves as our, our health and wellness center. Um, in it, it provides all of our health and wellness units and departments co-located in one um, central location to make it easy and convenient, not only for the students, but also for those staff and administrators overseeing those areas to be in more collective conversation in support of the student experience. On the other side of that facility is a residential space dedicated and devoted to wellness and well-being. Um, it is an application process for rising students not available to new students entering into the community, but as a continuing student, you can submit an application and talk about your definition of well-being and how that would complement the program that exists in Stern Lake Commons. Coming online this fall, or actually August of 23, will be two new re residential buildings, the um, Danoff Residence Hall and the Chen Family Hall. Um, these two buildings will add an additional 351 bed spaces to our existing housing inventory, and Sternlet Commons added 163 beds to our overall stock and inventory. These two new residence halls are primarily designed to support all returning students. Um, there are a few specialty programs that exist when we expanded our theme communities that I'll highlight at the next slide, but it's really designed to create the community space that we want to do in terms of reimagining that residential student experience. We have heard time and time again, students love the idea of alone together. So this idea of having single room occupancy for them to be alone, but still have some shared community spaces. And so all of these new constructions in Danoff and Chen are suite designed um, with as low as a two person suite all the way up to a four person suite. They have a common area space that they share and then each of the floors have additional community spaces um, that exist. There's kitchen space, there's lounge space, and then on each of the ground level or first floors of each of those communities are expansive meeting rooms and additional lounge and community and gathering space to bring students together. Next slide. Um, one of the things that we continue to hear, and this is our opportunity to improve and enhance our operational excellence, is the way in which our housing selection process works. And so this impacts our current students or returning students after they've been um, with us after the first year, had the ability to select their own housing. Um, and we found that time and time again, our students report that we can, as a department, do better by way of creating fewer barriers or obstacles um, for them to make those types of selections. So in this last year um, for selection for this upcoming 23-24 academic year, we introduced an, a slightly modified timeline. Um, we recognize that students with um, needs related to housing accommodations and those expressing um, needing to be in environments where their religious practices and preferences um, are the priority, we have moved that timeline up and review to earlier in the fall semester, such that we know that in advance and students have a longer lead time and be able to provide that documentation before we get to the actual placement um, that takes place in the spring. We also created an earlier decision and selection process for our seniors. Um, we do have a three year or six semester residency requirement and so therefore students in their senior year are not required to live with us, but many choose to live with us. And so we've actually moved the senior selection process to the fall so that we actually have a more accurate account of the number of students who will want to be in residence with us as we, put, as we plan our selection process for the spring. Doing so by adding these two elements and components in the early part of the fall semester allows us then to improve the communication and selection processes that are offered to the rising juniors and uh, sophomores for the spring 
including those that we may release as part of our junior class lottery. As we have now um, introduced more bed space to our housing inventory, we do want, we are getting closer to having adequate bed space to meet that residency requirement. And we recognize that that would then mean a small number of juniors may still need to be released as part of our off-campus lottery process. Um, in all of this, we have been, um, it's been important for me to make sure that we create a level of transparency um, and create a more robust communication plan um, with our students. Anecdotally, we've heard that students um, are a little sick of the communications that we send, but that in, in, in and of itself proves that we are communicating with urgency and um, appropriately to our students to make them aware of every step of our selection process so that they know when to apply, when deadlines are approaching, when deadlines have passed, and what the next steps look like in all of this. Beyond the email communications, we've also made sure that we are open and available for open office hours and communications in real time um, with tabling that's happening in our dining facilities and across campus, um, open office hours with any member of our residential life team, not just those that do operations. And then we have created online tutorials and user guides available on our website for those that have different learning styles to kind of understand our selection processes. And then what we're also making sure that we do is that while this may be um, selection as part of residential life, we do have ripple effects of the work that we do in our services that impact others. And so we are making sure that we're more appropriately aligned in communication with our enrollment management efforts um, and that of bringing students in and thinking about when they study away and study abroad, to make sure that those timelines are more aligned and in place. Next slide. I'm excited to be able to uh, share a few of the new enhancements. So we will continue to make um, improvements around our programmatic efforts, the way in which our community coordinators, um, which for our newest members of the Brown community serve as nationally our RAs. Um, our community coordinators are there and in place to provide programs, events, and initiatives um, that speak to all of the, uh, the strategic priorities that I mentioned earlier, but also to create a level of belonging community engagement. Um, there are educational components, but by and large, we want them to create events that simply bring people together um, to be in community, to get to know one another. In addition to all of those new initiatives, and programs that our community coordinators and our area coordinators will be offering. And pleased to share that we have announced in early spring that laundry services in all of our residential spaces will continue to be complementary for this foreseeable future. Um, that, as part of that uh, new contract with laundry, we have new machines and new technology that should enhance that laundry experience for our students. In the fall, we will actually be launching a mobile app to make it easier for students to actually have access to those machines in their laundry rooms. They'll be able to actively see when machines are available. They'll be able to determine when their cycles are actually complete um, and make their way down. And then um, there's an enhanced feature that will allow you to use your mobile device to actually activate the laundry machines without having to touch the kiosk or use your actual brown um, card. We're also excited that we've introduced three new theme communities to our residential portfolio. And these three new theme communities actually exist in the new construction that I mentioned earlier. We're pleased to bring on um, a partner with the Swearer Center and in creating the civic engagement community. We're partnering with the Chaplains and Religious Life to introduce interfaith and partnering with our Associate Provost of Sustainability to create a sustainability community. In its new inaugural cohort, each of these communities will have 14 students. Um, and the hope is that through their program this year, they will become um, ambassadors of the program so that, such that we can either expand these three communities or invite new members to join us um, in the next iteration. We've heard time and time again that students would like to be able to see spaces in advance of the housing selection. And so this year we were successful in creating in-person tours um, as part of our uh, selection process. But we will be working with vendors over the summer and introducing into the fall 
creating virtual tour opportunities such that you will have the ability to see spaces in a variety of our buildings and see those various room types and they will either be staged or actual student rooms throughout that process. In addition to these virtual tours, we will actually enhance our floor plans, move away from square footage, and maybe even have students the ability to manipulate and move some of our um, amenities and furniture that exist in the space for you to figure out the optimal, optimal um, living arrangement for you. And then lastly, we are in partnership with uh, not only our facilities management uh, division, but also thinking more broadly around the university finance um, and design team to revisit our housing master plan. Um, the master plan was developed years ago prior to my arrival that focused more on the lifespan of buildings with our new re-engagement model and the way that we are reimagining the residential student experience. We can actually now prioritize the residential experience of the things we know our students need and desire in these residential spaces, while also looking at the lifespan of a building and finding a more um, alignment in those particular priorities. We will continue to offer summer projects and initiatives in addition to this housing master plan um, around our renewal and renovation efforts. And then to do so, we want to partner and actually create a student advisory board that would be part of this planning of this housing master plan. Next slide. I'm very excited for those of you that are with us this year um, that we will, in one of our summer initiatives, be repurposing and renovating Graduate Center. Um, Graduate Center is in our renewal and housing master plan um, scheduled to go through a complete uh, renewal effort. And Graduate Tower C is the first in that iteration. We will duplicate many of these efforts in future summers um, with some of the other towers. But what I'm excited about is that we'll actually create some color coding and wayfinding to make it easier to navigate um, the Graduate Center because it can be a bit confusing as you move and navigate those particular spaces. Graduate Center is all suites, and so you have common area just only in your suite space, um, and then everyone kind of centralizes in the second floor uh, tower of Graduate uh, Tower E as the larger community space. The kitchens in those spaces serve as the community space. And so we're actually gonna make some modifications and expand that to be a more inviting and walking in space, not only to update the kitchen amenities, but perhaps bring people out of the suites into these uh, lounge slash kitchen environments to create a greater sense of belonging and community. In addition to the kitchen spaces, there will be updates made um, to the interior of the suites. The rooms themselves, the sleeping arrangements will remain intact, but we will make updates to all bathroom facilities. There will be new flooring, um, updates to fixtures and finishes in the toilets and shower stalls and in the actual fi uh, fixtures themselves, the faucets. And then we'll actually be creating a floor to ceiling partition in each of those bathroom spaces to create a greater level of privacy since many of the suites that exist in Grad Center are identified in our selection process as single occupancy to select into, such that you may not know the other folks joining you in that suite until after our selection process has concluded. By adding these floor to ceiling partitions, it creates an, an, another reassurance and greater sense of privacy in those um, shared spaces. Next slide. Um, our last slide before I think I move into Q&A, is that we're also excited that we're introducing a new educational awareness program called The Block, Brunonians Living Off Campus. And this is our effort in educating those students, particularly our rising seniors and juniors who are living in the community um, to know a little bit more about what that would look like living in the city of Providence. So we will focus on skill development, thinking about the life skills you need to know to live independently um, after having spent a number of years with us on campus. That will show up in the forms of webinars and video tutorials and open office hours, coaching, mobile app um, devices where you can quickly learn and find these valuable resources available to you. We'll then partner with our community uh, partners, our neighborhood associations, the Chamber of Converse, the mayor's office, for students to understand and be educated about living in the community. What does it mean to be um, a member of the Fox Hill or College Hill, uh, College Hill Neighborhood Association. 
thinking about the ordinances that are in place and creating greater awareness around your living environment. And then the last phase of our block program is actually introducing students in, to their neighbors themselves. And so creating opportunities where students will learn the art of intergroup dialogue and being able to introduce themselves and move through that particular process. Hi, my name is, I live next door. If you need anything, or if you um, would like to discuss events that are happening on our campus or across at our neighbor, excuse me, at our home, here's my card, here's my information and how we can engage. And we'll culminate that with a bookend of block parties, if you will, where we will bring the community together, um, both our students and that of the greater Providence community, um, so that everyone understands that us um, as a member of the Providence, um, the city of Providence have meaningful and can positively contribute to the community. Next slide. Uh, lastly, the first year students will um, receive additional communication from our office after the um, commitment days and communications with our admission office. We will provide students with a questionnaire where they can provide information about who they are, how they plan to show up on campus. That is what we will use to actually pair our students and move them through their first year living with us. We will then place, you'll get those assignments in mid-July. And then I referenced our community coordinators and our area coordinators who are professional staff members who live in residence that will serve as year-round support um, for your students in your first year journey. More information will be provided as part of your onboarding of orientation, which is also a component of residential life. Next slide. Raquel, I think this is the part where if there are any additional questions um, that I wasn't able to cover, I'm happy to do that now. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda for um, such a comprehensive um, presentation. And I think you did answer a lot of the questions we got in advance, but I think I have a few more um, that we'll go through. Um, one person was thanking you for the, the complimentary laundry. Uh, so there was a shout out there. Um, but I got a question earlier about, could we clarify the students still do have to do their own laundry, right? Yes, it's not fully complimentary <laughs> for you. Um, but the complimentary for us means that there is no um, advanced payment. So students will simply swipe their card or access our laundry services, but it's not a deduction from their actual bare bucks account. There is a kind of free tender that exists on their card that the university will assume for them to be able to take advantage of laundry services. They must still take their laundry down to the facilities and do the laundry themselves. Though I do believe we may be introducing a uh, dry cleaning service um, or offering um, for families in the fall, but more on that when we launch our laundry services um, and available to students later on. Oh, that's very exciting. Thank you. Uh, so another question um, that came in was about the beds in the rooms. Um, are the beds assigned or is that something that people negotiate when they first get there? It is a whole lot of negotiation. So ours stop short of the room itself. And so for our returning students, they already have an idea of who they're gonna live with and can certainly negotiate those particular conversations. For our new students coming in, um, we do not assign an actual bed, but the idea is by us giving you the room assignment information, in advance, so around the latter part of July, you have about a month's time to actually connect with your roommates, have those conversations, and maybe even coordinate when you're actually going to arrive, such that you might both arrive um, at the same time, and therefore you both enter into the space and be able to figure out what's happening. If that isn't going to work just based off of travel constraints, then at least you're in conversation in advance of that to say, it looks like our room is going to be designed this way. Perhaps I take the one closest to the window or I take this, but you'll have the ability to kind of make those negotiations. If you decide um, after you've configured all of that, that it just simply doesn't work out, you don't need to report back to us that you've changed beds. You can manipulate and move around in that particular space. If you find that the room itself is not conducive to our arrangement of assigning you a roommate, that is where we would ask you to then partner and be in conversation with our community coordinators or our area coordinators to talk about um, the challenges that might exist in the room to see if that can be kind of mediated 
or if a room change is necessary, then our team, our team is equipped to provide you with those steps. Okay, thank you. Um, can you talk about uh, the website itself where people can find where the schedule of when um, certain fees are due? Sure, so our ResLife website, um, we're continuing to make those improvements. Um, but if you were to look under for returning students, it's all under your um, current student profile. There is a link to the tuition and fees that we partner with our student accounts office that kind of lays out when those fees and structures would be in place. If you are a new family member or new student, you would look under the link that says first year students. And again, that same um, a mirror image of those same offerings on the left navigation menu exists for you, only the types of buildings and room assignments are slightly different from that our returning student population. Right, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about security in and around the dorms? Sure. Um, so all of our current practices is that they have a hard key to enter in their student room, but their brown ID is used to access the entrances to all of the buildings. Students are only assigned access to the building of which they live. And so we do not create this open air environment of every student having access or that the buildings are actually open for a period of time. So that is one layer of security. We also then through our programming get students to really get to know everyone that lives in the building. We want you to feel comfortable with people coming in to building and coming behind you that you can identify them as members of your community and build that, um, that level of confidence that you are surrounded by people who should be in that space. Um, we have EPS and some other staff that they hire that do regular rounds of the exterior spaces um, and can report back to us in residential life if they discover that doors are propped or things of that nature or mechanisms not working. We partner very quickly with facilities management to get those uh, matters resolved as quickly as possible. And then more importantly, we rely on community members. When we see something, say something. If someone, um, if something looks out of place or doesn't look like it existed there the day before, notify us in our office. Um, if you identify an individual that you have not noticed before coming through the buildings, by all means, it's better to be safe than sorry and, and communicate that to us. We, as a standard in the university, require that every professional staff member from Res Life and even our facilities and custodial staff who find themselves in and out of the building more often than our general administrators are always uh, identified with either our paraphernalia, our uniforms, uh, have our name badge, our logos, and we're all required to carry a brown ID. And at any point, a student can stop, ask who we are and the purpose of our visit in those spaces. And we, we certainly report that back out to you. Thank you, Brenda. I'm gonna go uh, with one more Res Life question before we turn it over to our friends in dining. And then if we have time at the end of the session, we'll, we'll do a few more. Um, can you talk about the move-in dates for uh, sophomores, junior, seniors, and then um, for the first year students? Yes. So it is our hope that by the end of this week, we actually um, upload the full calendar of all of the um, processes and dates that are impactful to the residential student experience, such that you have it including move in, move out, and key dates along our selection process. For the purposes of this session, um, new students move in is Wednesday, August 30th, and more details around the timing and scheduling of that will be forthcoming. And then that Saturday, which would be September 1st, so, sorry, September 2nd is returning move-in day for our current sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Um, again, look for that to be posted on our website um, at the end of the week. And then for our current students, we will actually send a communication out to you identifying that these dates have been added to our page for you to be able to start to pre-plan around your arrival and departure for next year. All right. Thank you, Brenda. We'll give you a break for a minute and we'll... Uh... Turn it over to Michelle with Dining Services uh, to, forget, to begin their presentation. Michelle, take it away. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Blaze. Um, I'm the Director of Wellness and Nutrition for Dining Services. I'm a registered dietitian. Um, I work with a lot of students with food allergies or other dietary restrictions. 
Um, I'm joined today by Bobby Noyes. Bobby, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Bobby Noyes, I'm the director of retail dining on, dining on campus. Um, so that entails um, that I oversee um, six out of our eight physical locations on campus from everything from culinary operations to service. And we're going to get started on some of our locations that Bobby oversees, as well as um, some other locations on campus. Next slide. All right, so on campus, um, we have two all you care to eat facilities, the Sharp Refectory and the Burning Woolly, or um, as we affectionately refer to them, the Ratty and the V-Dub. We have some um, locations that are um, that are a board and retail hybrid, I'd like to explain them as. That's the Ivy Room, Andrews Commons, and Josiah's. They're retail units, however, they're larger dining spaces, and um, we serve and accept um, meal swipes in those locations. And then we have some um, retail specific units, the Blue Room, the Coffee Bar and Cafe at the School of Engineering, and the Campus Market, which is a C store that sells things on the go and um, some dorm supplies as well. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna go over meal plans. Uh, we did just release the new meal plans for the fall semester. Um, you can view everything that has to do with meal plans, pricing, everything can be viewed on our website and the um, link will be provided. Thank you. Um, so quickly I'll overview for new students and um, anyone new, um, that a meal credit and a flex point is a little bit different, but all meal plans come with both of them. So a meal credit, also known as a swipe, is used to get into the all you care to eat facility. So you give your card to the cashier, they swipe it, and then the whole dining hall, you can take as much or as little as you would like. Um, meal credits can also be used, as Bobby said, at retail locations. It's used sort of like a bundle so they can get um, an entree, a side, and a drink, and then they could use a swipe or a credit to pay for that meal. The next form of tender is a flex point. So you can see on the slide, there are a certain amount of flex points that come with each meal plan. And that's used as cash on hand or a debit account. So if you wanted to go to say Blue Room and get a cup of coffee and it costs $3, you'll charge that as flex points and then $3 will be coming out of your flex account. Um, the top two meal plans, the weekly 20 and the flex 460 are for first year students. Second year students can have um, the 20 weekly as well as the 14 weekly, the flex 460 and the flex 330. And then we just released a new meal plan. So we got rid of the seven weekly and the off campus meal plan, if anyone is familiar with those two. And we are moving forward with a flex 70. So um, Third and fourth year students can choose from any of those meal plans. Off campus students can also choose from any of those meal plans. Um, I'll quickly go into the difference between a 20 weekly and a Flex 460 because we tend to get a lot of questions about that. So, a 20 weekly, every week, 20 new meal credits go onto your account um, and they don't roll over. Whereas with the flex plan, you get 230 meal credits or those swipes that I was talking about for the entirety of the semester. And whatever is not used at the end of the semester rolls over to the next semester between fall and spring. Whatever is not used between meal credits and flex points at the end of the spring semester is forfeited by the end of the year. Um, I think I overviewed everything, but like I said, everything, a, a lot more information on meal plans can be found on the website. Um, and one more thing that um, the vending machines on campus, a lot of them do take flex points as well. If you're on the go between classes or practice and you want to grab a quick snack. Uh, next slide. So these are some important dates to keep in mind for the fall semester. So there is a new portal that launched in the fall of 2022, where students make changes, cancellations, um, view their balances. It's called Atrium. We'll talk a little bit about it in the next slide. But that is where students will make cancellations, changes, um, like I said, view their balances. But the last day to make, the last day to cancel the meal plan for eligible students is August 29th. That's before classes start. That's before move-in. The meal plan starts on August 30th, and the last day to cancel a meal plan for eligible students is August 29th. 
Eligible students are students that are not first or second year students. So anyone above that third, fourth, graduate, med school, anything like that. Um, so eligible students are third, fourth, those years. Um, those students, if you do not make changes to your meal plan or if you do not cancel your, me your meal plan, you will be provided the meal plan that you were on the previous semester. So if the current semester spring and you're a sophomore student and you're on a flex 330, next semester, if you don't cancel that meal plan or if you don't make changes to it, you'll be assigned the flex 330 for the fall of 2023. And the last day to make a change to your meal plan, whether you wanna to switch to a different meal plan, a higher, a lower meal plan is September 13th. You can make as many changes as you'd like in the portal up until August 29th. Between the dates of August 29th and September 13th, only one change is allowed. And then meal plan starts on August 30th, which I believe is move-in day, and that's at dinner time. Communications for this information has already started going out to students who are second, third, fourth year students, graduate students, first year or incoming students will be getting their communications starting the first week of June. And all links and all of this information can also be found on the website. Next slide. Thank you, Michelle. You made this one pretty quick. Um, the software that Michelle was speaking about, um, Atrium, we just launched uh, this past year and we're really excited about it. Uh, we feel um, both as um, administrators and also um, front end users, we feel that it's much more user friendly, easy access. Um, so the portal that Michelle was speaking about in the last slide is mycard.brown.edu. Um, you can log into that. You can manage your account. Um, there's a, a friends and family link. There's also one specific to students. So this can manage meal plan as well as add bare bucks um, that Brenda was talking about um, in her presentation. So that can all be accessed there and we'll leave a link to that. And um, one thing that we do in all of our dining spaces throughout campus, especially at the uh, beginning of a semester or definitely at the beginning of a new school year, is we put QR codes um, at the cashier stands that will allow um, students to access the portal so they can make changes if necessary, they can view their balances just until they're accustomed to um, going into that themselves and accessing that information on a regular basis. Next slide. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what is to come in the fall, because we have a lot of exciting new things. So we have some, I'll start with the renovations to the Sharp Refectory um, for incoming students, the Sharp Refectory is what we call, well, Bob, we mentioned also people lovingly call it the Ratty, but it is our main dining hall on campus or the biggest dining hall on campus. Um, there are a couple of renovations coming. So we're adding a full kosher kitchen. So a kosher meat and a kosher dairy kitchen, two separate kitchens. We're also adding a separate station called the allergy aware station. And so this station doesn't serve the top nine allergens and gluten. So um, you'll always be able to find meals there um, that fit your needs. If you have celiac or gluten-free or dietary restrictions, most, most allergens um, are removed at that station, or I should say all top nine allergens are removed at that station. And then we're also advancing our halal options. So we currently have all of the fresh chicken that comes in house is halal. So most of our chicken dishes, as well as our as well as our all of our vegetarian dishes dishes, are halal. But now we will be dedicating a station in the Sharp Refectory to be fully halal. And so students who, um, regardless of if you follow halal dietary practices or not, um, will always be able to find an option there. None of these stations require any type of accommodation, so it's open to all students. It's just additional options that are available to everyone, no accommodations um, or you know, special allowances needed. I'll let Bobby talk about Josiah's. Yeah, absolutely. So Josiah's or Joe's is our late night dining location on campus. Um, it was one that I referred to in an earlier slide. It's a kind of hybrid between a board and a retail location. So. The format of service is retail, but they're um, permitted to use their meal swipes in the way of combos at Joe's. 
Uh, we're really excited to um, do a renovation to the dining area and the seating space at Joe's. Um, this is in um, conjunction with the Brook Street uh, residents that Brenda was speaking about in her presentation. Josiah's, for those that don't know, is actually located on the west side or kind of the connection to campus from those residents. So we're right in back and we're excited to get a refresh in the dining space that kind of matches the efforts that are going on in that project. And um, happy to say we're not going to stop there. We're going to go and uh, refresh our service area as well. We're adding a platform to Joe's. Um, it's going to be a barbecue concept. I say barbecue, but really it's kind of like all things that smoke complements. So we're going to do a lot of vegetables and fish as well. It's not just going to be kind of traditional meat-based barbecue. It's going to be located right next to our salad station. And believe it or not, Joe's is kind of known for that late night celebration food. However, we have the largest salad bar on campus at Joe's with the most amount of options there. So we're going to do a lot of things out of the smoker um, that'll be a great fit and complement to our salad bar there. We recently purchased a food truck and um, we intend to roll it out on a regular basis in the fall. We have um, intentions to use it to support athletic events and our efforts with concessions there. But we're also going to use it to complement service at all our units, um, really as an extension of a um, of the meal plan and of the dining unit on campus. So things that maybe we can't do in smaller batches at our larger facilities, we're going to really concentrate and offer on the food truck. So we're excited to roll that out as well. And then finally, some of our sustainability efforts that we have been doing for a full for a few years, but a lot of attention is on it already. So, well, the reusable container program we just rolled out this semester, we're doing a pilot program. Um, students are able to um, opt in to this reusable container program. We're partnering with a software company um, called Reuse Pass. And so students, when they sign up, they get their unique QR code. All of the containers have their own QR code as well. So all students have to do when they walk into the dining hall, we're currently running it at the Sharp Refectory and the Bernie Woolley. So they walk up, there's a scanner at the cashier station, they scan their QR code, they scan the QR code on the container, and then they get to hold that container for, you know, however long they need. They grab their food, they um, eat it, and then they get to return it uh, within a couple of days. And they just drop it in the drop station and then we'll scan it back in and we'll wash it and sanitize it and then students can come back and pick up a new container next time they'd like a to go container. Um, we're really excited about this. We have a lot of waste that comes from the, the disposable containers at these two locations. So we're really looking forward to reducing that waste as well as providing students with um, you know, actionable items that they can do to help the environment. The next um, is the red meat reduction. We've actually been doing this since. I think as far back as 2019. Um, and really now is when we're talking about more about the efforts that we've been doing for years. Um, and so we understand that red meat has a negative impact on sustainability and on the environment. And so we wanna be able to provide students with options. Um, it's not to say that we don't serve red meat ever, um, but we're just reducing it. So we wanna be mindful of the serving sizes that we have of red meat, as well as how often that we're having it. Um, for these efforts, pork and beef are counting as red meat, um, but that's not to say that we're not serving delicious meals. Um, we can find a lot of things that are fish-based or chicken or turkey um, or vegetarian that um, still meet the needs of the students and can maintain our sustainability efforts here on campus. Um, this is a, you know, a university-wide effort um, to focus on sustainability, and this is one of the parts that dining is partaking in in order to meet the needs of the university. Next slide. So I'll quickly go over some of the options for students with dietary restrictions. I'm really looking forward to that new station coming live in the fall, the Allergy Aware Station. Like I said, that station doesn't serve any of the top nine allergens, but that's not to say that if you are someone who doesn't eat gluten, that you'll also have to remove all of the other allergens and you can no longer eat dairy or um, any of the other allergens. Um, that's just to say that you'll always be able to find a option there. And then you can also shop around the dining hall as usual. So if you, um, you know, the meals at that station are going to be 
um, what I call simple and straightforward, easy to identify ingredients. Um, from feedback that I've heard from students with food allergies specifically is that they don't want to have to guess what's in a food. They want to be able to see what it is right in front of them. And so that's what the station will be able to provide. And then they can also go shop around if they, you know, have a sesame allergy or a peanut allergy, but they still want the mac and cheese that's on the main line, then they can do that, but get, you know, a veggie or a protein at the, at the allergy station. Um, I mentioned we have the advanced halal station coming online as well as our full kosher kitchen. So we wanna be able to um, provide options for students who are all faiths and be able to provide um, you know, delicious meals for everyone. And so that's what um, we're definitely focusing a lot of our efforts on for this next year. And then students, if you have a medical diagnosis that's not covered under food allergies, um, you know, I meet with students individually. I really like to know who our students are on campus. Um, there may be options for them outside of the regular um, options for all students. And so I really encourage students with food allergies or religious restrictions, any type of medical diagnosis that affects their um, eating habits to reach out to me and we can set something up. I meet or I work closely with student accessibility services as well as the health services. I work, there's a dietitian in athletics um, and all of us work together on making sure that we are meeting the needs of the students and um, everyone is um, accounted for. Uh, some options that I'll quickly talk about is in two of our locations, the Vernie Willie and the Sharp Refectory, we have something called an allergy friendly pantry. And this is where we keep a lot of our specialty products. Students, um, I provide them access to this room. They get a key from the front desk and they go, they open it, they get what they need from there and then they return the key. So there's a lot of um, gluten-free breads and snacks and desserts, not just gluten-free, but other allergens as well. Um, it's a really open communication between myself and students for this room. We have a whiteboard. A lot of students reach out to me, email me, say, hey, we're out of vegan cream cheese. Can you make sure that it's in there for tomorrow or something like that? Um, so I really like to have that type of communication with students because I mean, this is their meal plan. This is their, you know, we're here for them. We want to make sure that they're getting the same foods that all the other students are getting. Um, and then individual accommodations. I can't really speak to exactly what that looks like. Every student is different, but I um, like to work with students individually and, and try and meet their needs. I believe that's it. Next slide. All right, so we get asked a lot. Um you know, how can I get involved? Um, so we in dining work very close with a group of students on all things dining, if you will, um, through the dining council. And it could be anything from um, menu concepts and what we're offering at a specific unit to how we communicate with the greater um, population and down to some initiatives like uh, Michelle was talking about red meat reduction and sustainability. So um, that's definitely one way where someone can get involved with us specifically in dining. Um, we also have uh, many opportunities for students to uh, to work with us if they choose to. Um, we have barista positions. We have server positions. They can work on catering events. They can work at athletic events. They can work in some of our units to make pizza and do a little bit more culinary intensive tasks. So we have plenty of opportunity and those are all um, posted on both the student job board and also in Workday, which they will get to know very closely if they're a new student. Um, and then just other student organizations that we work with. Um, I guess I could kind of cover the, the top three main ones. Um, Food, Recover uh, Food Recovery Network is a student organization that uh, manages all food donations with leftover foods and other goods on campus. We're working closely with them on donations. They do pickups at our locations daily. Um, the sustainability at Brown, that's another student group that we work very closely with. And um, the Underground Cafe, that's actually a 100% student-run coffee shop. That's located in the campus center underneath the Blue Room. And um, we not only collaborate with them, but we support them um, from a professional standpoint and consult with them on things like food handling, safety, purchasing, and everything like that. So um, there are plenty of ways to get involved if, uh, if one would choose to. 
Next slide. And I wanted to just provide you with some key contact information. Um, we know that a lot of questions usually come to dining, but some of it might gear towards other people. So I wanted to just provide you with information for that. If your student um, has any type of accessibility needs, we do ask that students, both with food allergies um, and other types of dietary restrictions, register with Student Accessibility Services. They're a great organization, they're a great department on campus to be able to provide um, insight for accessibility needs. Um, the dietitian at Athletics, as I mentioned earlier, her contact information is there. Also financial aid, just wanted to pop them in there because we get a lot of questions regarding um, cost and financial aid questions. And then any general dining questions, gear them towards our general um, dining services at brown.edu, and then um, it'll be directed towards the person um, who best fits that question. All right. Thank you, Michelle and Bobby. Um, we are very close to the end of our time, but uh, I did get one question about whether um, the dining halls will be open during the renovations that you talked about. Yep. Yes. So the um, renovations have already started in the Sharper Factory. Um, so it'll remain when we're open during the summer, the um, dining hall will still be open even during those renovations. And it's slated to open in the fall. So um, hopefully everything goes according to plan and we'll have um, new stations up and ready for when students join us in the fall. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and Bobby, can you talk about weekend and late night hours? If a student's looking for food uh, over the weekends or late at night, where's the best place to find that? Sure, yeah. So um, on the weekends, uh, Sharp Refectory is the primary all-you-care-to-eat facility. Andrews Commons is also open. Um, again, that's a hybrid location. It's half retail, half board. We accept meals all day there. And Joe's is our late night location. That's open 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. So on the weekends, we have services from and meals available 7.30 a.m. to 2 a.m. in the morning. And actually, Joe's seven days a week is open until 2 a.m. So we definitely check that box for late night. Great. Thank you. And then finally, Michelle, um, we did get a few questions that, that were really specific about certain allergies. Can you uh, just repeat how people go about getting in touch with um, somebody to talk about specific allergy questions? Absolutely. So if there's any specific questions um, about, you know, your students specific needs, reach out to the dining email and then it'll be directed towards me and we can make sure that we answer your question. I'll, I'll respond back. All right. Thank you so much.